So I'm not going to say too much about uh, CSDMS, but that's the organization that I run, uh, the virtual organization. It's in 68 countries, 500 institutions, uh, and it's about software. And so we supply uh, and have a repository for open uh, source software in the Earth surface dynamic modeling community. So everything from glaciers on the tops of mountains to the ocean and currents underneath and the seafloor, so everything in between, rivers, coasts. And uh, our claim to fame is we couple models. Um, and if you want to know more, I'd be happy to tell you about that. The other thing that I'm involved with is the IGBP. I'm the chair. And we're merging into a new organization called Future Earth. And that organization, uh, the new one, um, is already up and running. We're still in existence. We're sort of overlapping. And AGU is the big handoff this year. We'll have about 60 sessions and dancing and music. <laughs> so I'm here today to uh, tell you a little bit about things you might be interested in. I don't know. Uh, it's about the challenges of deltas, this uh, uh, environment that's between the ocean and the land where rivers meet the ocean. And uh, they're under a lot of uh, pressure, and it's getting a lot of press these days. And I'd like to walk you through that and possibly what your role in all of this should be. Oh, the WebEx. Here? Okay. So we never go back, <laughs> only in one direction. So I'll tell you a little bit about deltas and uh, global sea level, local sea level, and some methods, including INSAR. So um, I'm giving this talk because I gave a similar talk uh, recently, so I'm stealing a lot of stuff slides from that for this talk. So I grew up on a delta, it's called the Cam Delta. Um, that's a picture of it, the little stars where I live for many years. I wrote my first thesis on it in 1975, which means I'm old. Um, and then I got a doctorate degree on another delta someplace else. And the doctoral was from UBC. And I've been studying deltas on and off, um, mostly off, but I've visited about 50 of them, and I've written many papers on them. And I think they're all different. And I made that statement because I gave this talk at the International Association of Hydraulic Research in the Netherlands at the World Congress uh, last week. And so, you know, that's the Netherlands, and the Netherlands has a delta, and they like to uh, take what they've learned from their delta and share it around the world. And my Con my statement to them was that, you know, you can take your knowledge around the world, but your experience with the rhine muse Delta may not translate that well. And I think they know that. So, um, <clears throat> isn't this a great picture of our, uh, our own Delta, the Mississippi? So they're uh, very... Um, dynamic wetlands. You know, in the Mississippi, they had all this load, lobe switching. Uh, and within each one of these lobes, there was channel switching. And there would be the shift of the locus of deposition over time. And uh, while uh, the delta was in a certain location, it received a lot of sediment and it was getting worked on by rivers, waves, and tides. Very lush vegetation, the forest wildlife, fisheries. And generally, deltas are muddy, but they don't all have to be muddy. They can be 
coarse grain material. Most deltas formed about 7,000 years ago when sea level was stable and rivers were able to take the sediment that they had been filling in these uh, estuaries with over time. And when sea level got stable, after they filled these estuaries in, they started to prograde out into the coastline. And uh, there are some deltas that are more modern. This one is a, is a movie, a series of Landsat images of Madagascar Delta, the Mangorki Delta. And so the Pole Delta in Italy, the Ebro Delta in Spain, the Rhode Delta in France, those are all modern deltas. They were they grew because we, like in this case in the Madagascar, we cut down a lot of the forest, we disturbed the landscape, and a lot of sediment came down. So the yellow in the yellow delta in the China is another example. Now, you know, usually you're supposed to be very sure of your audience, and I'm not sure of my audience. So I don't know what you know and what you don't know. So I'm assuming you know this, that there's a global impact, the steric effect, the eustatic effect, uh, adding new water and all of that. And uh, my organization, and along with the World Climate Research Program, we were the two organizations over the last 30 plus years that were designed to provide the science for IPCC. And uh, those are giant organizations, you know, tens of thousands of scientists in different international projects and programs. And some of what we did was this study, this, you know, the global side, the contribution to uh, sea level rise. But for many of the people who live on the coastline, that's not a very important study or contribution to sea level. And I guess this talk is really to remind you all that, uh, yes, it's important to do this global stuff, but for many of the people living on deltas with 500 million people, they are not that interested in. And these local effects are way more important. The other thing, and I think you all know, because you probably are involved in uh, sea level studies, because you do geodetic research, is that these eustatic and steric rates are not uniformly equal. Over the last uh, 30 years, there's an unequalness to them. And this is a map of this unequalness. And, you know, uh, eventually over probably 100 years, maybe 1,000 years, this unequalness will start to mitigate out. But for these very short changes, right now a lot of the the sea level rise is because of dynamic topography, and that's where these uh, geostrophic currents are holding the warm water, and therefore you get the largest steric effect. So. Uh, but so if you look at these deltas where 500 plus million people are living, uh, they're sinking much faster than sea level is rising. And how fast is fast? Well, you know, on average, if you took all the large sort of temperate subtropic tropical deltas where people are living, not the Arctic ones, on average, they're sinking four times faster than global sea level is rising. And you get pictures like these two deltas where the pinks are areas below sea level protected from the ocean by barriers, either natural or human-constructed barriers. And some of these rates are outstanding. This is uh, tide gauges, but as I'm going to show you, tide gauges aren't all that interesting. They, they might be able to tell you that something interesting is happening, but you know it's one spot in a very large system, such as a delta. And just to give you some indication on the variability on these deltas, I got a few maps. The first one let's look at is this Jakarta 
this is from Del Terres, um, a research or knowledge institute in the Netherlands that I help advise. And so Jakarta in Indonesia, in the last uh, 35 years, you know, they it's sunk in places four meters. I mean, that's incredible. And when you think of uh, sea level rise during the 20th century, it was only 1.8 millimeters per year. You know, this is an incredible rate. A lot of it's due to um, uh, pulling water out of the ground, but there's many reasons that you can get subsidence. In the Chalfreya Delta, those uh, rings that you see there, that's, and that's up to over 100 millimeters per year. Again, compare that to 1.8 millimeters per year over the 20th century, it's kind of small. So 100 millimeters per year is just so overwhelming that sea signal that for anyone working in the coastal zone, that's what we focus on, not at all. We don't, we're not even that interested in what's happening in the, in the sea. You know, obviously when you're building things, you have to take into account 100, 200, 300 years into the future, and you do take into account sea level change. In, in the Chalfreya, it was sinking so fast, they introduced taxes on the a rate of water withdrawal so that it would be the equivalent if you took their currency on a purchasing power parity into our currency, it would be equivalent of $1 per shower is the tax they introduced to really stop their city, Bangkok, from sinking into the land and therefore the sea. And part of the reason of this is the rapid growth of these cities like Jakarta, like Bangkok. Bangkok went from a million to uh, 13 million in 35 years. So all these people just migrated in and all the rules and governance weren't there. So the Netherlands, you know, they really have learned to work with nature. It's a very positive thing. Nevertheless, you can't raise the area that's below sea level and a quarter of their country is below sea level. And in some, distance, some places, it's quite a ways below sea level. So not a meter, but many meters. Oh, and I, and all around the world, there's many examples of this. So I have both 20th century and 21st century um, ways of measuring subsidence, um, tide gauges being one, leveling, INSAR, although uh, you know that's that has its limitations and resolution limitations. LIDAR, uh, same thing, uh, it's limited in its vertical resolution. Stratigraphy, you know, for those who are doing geological evolution of a delta, that's very important. But ext extensometers, uh, GPS stations, um, um, and rods, uh, compaction rods are all very important. So here's an example, you take uh, some interferometric synthetic aperture radar signal, one date, then another date. The, the two dates have to be relatively close together again. If they're too far away and the subsidence is high, you will miss out the signal. And if they're too close together, you won't get the signal because of the resolution. You're looking for a millimeter per year resolution, and that's sort of the goal. Many people can't get that when they do this kind of analysis, so they're happy if they got a few millimeters per year. This is probably one of the big problems in all of this is the atmospheric correction. It's just, we can correct, sort of. We get an image, let's say, from MODIS. MODIS happens once or twice a day, and you have to take those snapshots and do a, a daily correction. Then every daily correction from all the time in between, that were the, are not the time in between, the, the time these signals, uh, INSAR signals were taken. And it is very problematic. Anyways, you're looking at the phase shifting of these two images. You're trying to ideally get the changes to be within um, 2 pi, and you'll get a difference 
phase difference that you convert to millimeters, such as this image on the yellow delta. So there is noise. A lot of the noise you see is from the sea. That's kind of good because it tells you where the ocean is. But you'll see these hairy signals uh, showing up on land surfaces too. And again, that's probably water, pools of water, ponds of water. You can look at a hot spot like I've shown here. You could zoom in on it. And the, the great thing about and why everyone's now in love with INSAR, even though it's very difficult to use in the tropics because of the moisture in the atmosphere, is that you can get the variability. And you, could, you can say, well, this is a hot spot. Let's have a look at why that's a hot spot. You can look at differences throughout a year or a couple of years, and you can see whether, oh, maybe this is something that only happens in the summertime, or it happens all year round, or whatever. In this case, this is a fish farm. Uh, and those bullseyes are over the pumping station that supplies the water. And it's, it's an incredible pumping station. So you can actually model the rate of water that they're pumping out of the ground with some simple pumping equation to get the subsidence right. And people have done this in very large areas all over the Mekong. Um, a group out of Stanford has done that. This subsidence rate, by the way, is uh, it's sinking rates of uh, one meter every four years. So uh, I'm, I have to assume they know that they're subsiding the land with that rate. I mean, their buildings might be cracking. I don't know. Um, and you may be interested in why they're pumping that much water. Well, first off, the water is salt water, and they're, the fish that they're raising is, uh, they make a lot of money on it, but the feces at the larval stage is, is such that they have to change the water um, every 10 days, or they'll do in the fish, the young fry. So. <clears throat> So it's an economic thing. When you use INSAR, it's really good to have uh, some other measurement that goes with it. I mean, you can use it on its own, but it's really better if you have it when you use it with something else. And the something else that sort of everyone loves is uh, GPS. And I'm showing that to let you know that we also try to take our INSAR uh, measurements and put them on on a station. Now, the, GPS, the INSAR you're getting is from this entire region, and the GPS is from one single location. But you can see that the, when we started the study, there were some things that we didn't get quite right, but from then on, we were following the GPS record. And you see this going up and down, up and down, up and down. And so then the question is, what is this up and down? Well, this is the Ganga Brahmaputra Delta, Magna Delta in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, there's a region of it, the Salat Basin. It's sort of a tectonically subsiding basin that is slowly sinking. And it fills up with water every year from the Brahmaputra River and also from the monsoons that just rain on that surface and the pooling water um, plus any runoff that they're getting uh, from the um, Brahmaputra River. It produces uh, an elastic response on the crust. It pushes, There's so much water there that the ground and the... Uh, the weight and the groundwater and the surface water weight are pushing down. You get a lowering, and then that's picked up by the GPS and the INSAR. And then as that season, monsoon season, relaxes, it pops back up and then down, up and down, up and down. But you can also see the trend, and the trend is really what 
we're all interested in for those of us working on INSAR. The up and down just lets you know that if you don't know what you're doing and you like look at one image or two images, you may be long off in what you're getting on your record. So uh, that was from, I think DACA is uh, in that part of the map. It's that black. That's the outline of the, ma of the city. And so I'm showing you this because one of the things we've discovered is that when we do INSAR measurements, we, we don't really know too much about what's happening under the ground, and that's where the story is. I mean, what's happening underground is why we're getting subsidence. And it could be mining of oil or gas, or it could be mining of water, or it could be oxidizing peat. doesn't really matter what the, the thing is, but we're seeing the subsidence on the land surface, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And it's all going on underground. And so... What we found in the study on the uh, Ganga Brahmaputra Delta is that the geology under the surface, the subsurface geology, really has an impact of where you're getting subsidence. And so if you're getting stiffer clays, maybe Pleistocene clays rather than Holocene clays, and you compare that with some softer, more recently deposited river sediment, you can get quite large differences. And so, um, so working with a geologist or geophysicist who can get this information really brings alive any kind of subsidence measurements you happen to be doing. And otherwise, you will get people like me who really don't know anything about the subsurface making up stories. So I think geology is kind of good. In this particular case, you know, you're getting uh, areas of... Uh, uh, this delta that are subsiding at 10 to 15 millimeters plus a year. So subsidence, even on giant deltas, is always going on. So let me tell you about why, and I think this why is what's going to blow your mind. Why, why are we in this world that we're in? So first off, there was a time when there weren't that many people living on deltas, and for good reasons. They're not the greatest places to live, even though I was born on one, you know. Um, they usually have a lot of insects, mosquitoes being one of them, but other parasites, dengue fever, West Nile, uh, yellow fever, the list is uh, a long one. And so the people who are living there, when they're growing up, they want to leave the Delta, escaping the Delta from this blues singer that I thought I liked that picture of. But we've really tamed these Deltas. We've tried to get rid of the wetlands. We've tried to make the problems go away, the insects go away. And we're... So we have two things going on. We have population increase and we have migration. So let's talk about population increase. So first off, you, the red dot is where we are today, and we're going to gain another 3.2 billion people conservatively by 2100. So what does that translate to? Well, that translates to a city of Denver every 10 days. So, and they're all moving into cities. So when I say cities, it's about a new city every 10 days the size of Denver. Every 10 days every 10 days. Uh, people don't like talking about population, but I think no matter what our problems are now, we're going to get another 3.2 billion people. Did I say that once before? So in the deltas, we've had migration. One of the largest migrations in the history of the world is onto deltas in the last 35 years. And we created all these mega cities. So megacity is a city that's 10 million people. And uh, so we've got, we've really taken these sizable cities already in 1975, and we made almost all of them into megacities. The Nile is a classic example. 
So I think Egypt's population is around 80 million people. About most of it's on the on the Nile. About 50 million of the 80 million is on the Nile. That's a lot of people. And so when you look at these channels that were mapped out, geolocated and mapped out uh, on the Nile from 1813 to 1922, you'll see that there's some shifting. Well, that's how deltas work, right? They have these channels and they shift around. They find the low spots. Eventually, there'll be some flood and they'll find the levees will break and they'll find a low spot and that becomes their new channel. Well, if you have 50 million people living on a delta, you certainly don't want channels to shift. So you do a number of engineering things to stop them from shifting. Um, the Fraser Delta in Canada is a perfect example. You build a, a major Canadian airport, you, the last thing you want is that airport to be inundated by floodwaters. So first thing you do, like on the Nile, is you build a dam. This is a large dam, the Aswan Dam, and you can look at the discharge record in it's in uh, thousands of cubic meters per second, and you can see these flood waves just disappear. And you also see the base flow increases, and the reason for that is because you want to grow crops, three crops a year, rather than two crops or one crop a year. So you've increased food production, you cut the floods, so the people who are living there feel safer. You've also, you look at this satellite image, all this dirty sediment that was flowing in at the beginning is no longer flowing in. So you cut the sediment from these deltas. But even if the rivers had sediment, you, you basically stopped the river from flooding with the dirty water in the first place, but you've also stopped the sediment from getting to the coastline, which would offer some protection. You've done two things. So this is a map of, a global map of, of large uh, dams, large dams, uh, 45 meter plus. And we built one of these large dams every 130, every day for the last 130 years. Oh, and we keep building dams. Yes, we are removing a few small dams in the U.S., particularly one of the few countries that are removing dams, but in general, we keep adding dams around the world. And so you get less and less sediment. You know, uh, the China was the first in the Mekong to uh, dam up that river system, and now Laos is uh, hot on the trail of doing that, Cambodia, Mekong. I mean, it's, we, we keep damming rivers. So with my climate buddies, I work on, uh, we operate CSDMS, we operate the Dartmouth Flood Observatory, which we've changed its name to the, Dart, to the Flood Observatory, since we're no longer at Dartmouth College. Anyways, we, mu we map the inundation of the land surface uh, twice a day, every day, and we're looking for changes in inundation or flooding, and we produce these maps. So this is a map produced from showing the extent of a particular flood. And this is Bangkok, you can see down here. And this is the area upstream of Bangkok that was flooded. And you also see maps that we produce uh, showing the increase in flooding over time. So in our climate world, we're expected there, uh, the atmosphere to uh, warm up which it is, and to hold more moisture, which it can, and therefore produce more intense rainfalls, which it does, and therefore we get an intensification of the hydrological cycle. It also, in these areas of dry areas, it produces more erratic or chaotic uh, rainfall, which also increases the number of floods. So we would like to tell a climate story, but in fact, many times these floods occur because of engineering failures. And many of the large floods that we see, they all have an engineering side to them. Something failed. So it's not just an intensification of the hydrological cycle. There's all this stuff happening. In this case, the, the dam had so much water, it was holding so much water. It's like a bank account all, and you know, uh, money in, money out. So they hold this water and release it when it can increase their profit margin for that year, as all dam operators do. And uh, 
uh, a monsoon s uh, system was on its way, the dam was too full, the last thing a dam operator wants is to overtop, so they release the water. And so even though this flood caused billions of dollars of damage, killed people, it could have been a lot worse had the dam operator let it overtop the dam. So you release the water. And you get these failures. Another thing that engineering has done is it's basically intercepted the fresh water from getting to the coast in the first place. So in this in this you'll see circle at the top that says 108 cubic kilometers of water and only 45 that enters the sea with most of the water being taken out into agriculture and other domestic use. All those red dots on another map by a colleague of mine, John Milliman, is uh, the amount of water getting to these deltas has been reduced by more than 30% over the last 50 years. And it's because of things like the Indus. The water doesn't get to the coast. And when it doesn't get to the coast, it does all sorts of harmful things. So, now I'm going to be a professor. So, I know there are some students here, so take note. So this is the only note-taking thing in the whole thing, is this. So when you're looking at a coastal system, these are the main properties you want. And it's probably a little more complicated than this, but I've tried to simplify it as best I can. You've got the things that are happening in the ocean. We'll call it used to see. We'll lump everything in there. So we'll lump the ocean warming and the volume increase due to melting ice glaciers and what have you, ice sheet. Groundwater. Anyways, all the things that make the global ocean go up. And so globally in the 20th century, I said it was 1.8 millimeters per year. It's now 3.2 millimeters per year, and it's expected to possibly double in the next 100 years. So see, the, those rates are going to increase. And I, I've got a range in there because I, in that earlier map, it's not so equal. So you may have areas in the, if we went back, you would have seen the west coast of the U.S. doesn't show much sea level rise at all. And the east coast shows more than the 3.2 millimeters per year. So you've got that. And then you've got aggradation. That's the amount of sediment you're adding as a new layer to a delta. And there's a range. Well, first off, if you're not, if the rivers are all dammed, you're no longer putting sediment to the delta. And then likely these rivers are fixed with levees and you don't allow the flood waters with this, any sediment there to get to the surface. So it could be anywhere between zero and 10 millimeters per year, highly variable in space and in time. Load isostasy, well, uh, you still have the e-folding time from when water went up. Uh, and this um, water isostasy, uh, the e-folding time of isostasy for that would be, I don't know, 3,000 uh, years. So every 3,000 years, it's decreasing by half, 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 half. So we still have a signal that's showing up on the coast. But for big, large deltas like the, uh, when you have billions of tons in a large area like the Mississippi that are 30 meters thick, you might even have a, a sediment deposit uh, isostatic impact. But there's other tectonic uh, things that can go on. Most of these large deltas have faults underneath them, even our own Mississippi. So that M is extremely complicated, not just with that term set. Natural compaction, well, you've got things, void spaces will densify with load, and so you have natural compaction. And human subsidence is the big one, where you can decrease that uh, void space through a variety of ways. Usually it's petroleum or water mining and peat oxidation. But if you look at those terms, they're so close to one another that any change to one of them changes the whole equation. That's the problem. There isn't a dominant number in there. It's just one of those remarkable things because if you took the human substance away, it's, you can go one way or the other easily whether you got a prograding or a grading delta or not. 
So let's just look at some of these terms. So there's the 21st century aggradation rate of adding sediment versus the 19th century, and so we basically don't have sediment going to deltas anymore. Here's one a practical example where we dammed up the Spanish River, the Ebro, and you can see the water flux to the coast went from 1732 to 300 more recently, and it's much lower than that now. And the sediment is all but gone. And now they're trucking sediment to where to maintain that road where the, there's some salt works uh, on that wing of the delta. And so they are where the river once delivered sediment, we now have trucks. So this is human engineering at its worst. But we know that things can improve. So let's look at this. Uh, this is a map, 60 millimeters per year subsidence on the uh, Po Delta in Italy. And just to the north is Venice. Venice was quite upset. So they said, no, 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 you're sinking our city. Stop it. So they stopped it. <clears throat> and it started to recover. So a few years later, the, it went from 60 to, to a bullseye of 20 millimeters per year. And today, this is the substance on the Pope. You can see where Venice is. And the bullseye is around four millimeters per year. That's about ambient conditions for a delta. So if you stop doing something bad, you can at least not make it worse. So, so deltas are the rice bowls of the world. Um, and have been for a long time. You know, this is a crop map showing the intensification of crops. But we've taken them and we've just changed them in the last 15 years. It's probably one of the most unwritten about stories. And we've changed them into protein bowls. We've cut all the mangroves down. Um, that would help protect them from a storm surge, let's say from a hurricane or cyclone or whatever you want to call them, typhoon. And we've made all these uh, shrimp farms, fish farms, whatever. And it's, it's an incredible story. Um, so that's what we've done. And I'm going to end with this last chapter. Consequences and adaptation. So when I broke this story with uh, a team um, in 2007, or was it nine? So it's not like we didn't know all the things that I just presented, but it was never broken in a big way. So when it finally got broke that we're, we've got all these millions of people on deltas that are sinking rapidly below sea level, the news really picked it up all over the world. This is some more recent uh, news article on the Nile, but it doesn't really matter. It's being picked up by the news now. I don't think it's, it's no longer not known to the public. Now, the public really have a, an attention span of 20 minutes, so uh, I think you know you have to keep hammering on these things for it to have any impact at all. But all over the world, whether it be in China news or Indian news, this story is being picked up. Cambodia picked it up. Canada's Fraser picked it up. Um, and here's a satellite set of satellite images on the Mississippi. So I just want to show you that, yeah, we could just look down and see this thing just disappearing in front of our eyes. And it's not just a hurricane like Hurricane Rita or something like that. If you look at these images, it's disappearing every year. And it's true that a single hurricane can do damage that then makes the subsequent years uh, more susceptible. I've got two images here. One's from air photographs, and that is the, um, the surface one, the yellow one from the U.S. Army when they were mapping the Indus in, uh, now in India then, but now it's in uh, Pakistan. And the 2000 Landsat image. And you can see what happens when you cut 
uh, delta from getting water and sediment. Basically, the tidal channels just rip through the system. You can also see the tidewater extend move landward. There's about 2 million people that are on this delta that just moved off of it. All the farming went away, and basically we have a dead delta. The saline soils are such that you all the cattle that were there and the other farming activities have disappeared. You can also see when you get rid of this protected mangroves, the rate of uh, shoreline retreat, this image here is uh, of telephone poles along a road that's now underwater. So, you know, and then you get crazy ideas like the Chinese want to put a wall around their coastline. This is in science, by the way. So this is uh, this year's science. They want to build 11,000 kilometer seawall all around their country. One of the craziest ideas I've ever come across. Longer than the Great Wall, so maybe that's the motivation. And what happens is countries will run out of money because you have to keep fixing these things. You don't just build it and say, well, it's done, folks. You have to repair it. And, you know, the levees on the, uh, the Ganga River, as an example, in this series of photographs, they have to repair that every single year. It just takes an enormous amount of money. In addition, you get a storm surge coming in. In this case, Cyclone Ayla that hit the Ganga Delta, its storm surge was six to seven meters. So, I mean, it will just whip, whip through one of these walls that is too costly for most countries to afford in the first place. And even in rich countries, our country, we have failures all the time. I mean, from way back in history to more modern times, this just happens. No one builds perfectly. So, you know, a lot of people think we should adapt. And, you know, there's the Vietnamese method or the Amazon method. Or the Dutch method. I like the German method particularly. <laughs> so, you know, maybe that's one thing that we could start doing. But if you think about, we're talking about half a billion people here. I don't think some of these modern European methods are going to be a way of solving the problem. So there's a saying in our country, it's called fight or flight, protect or get out of the way. And so I'm, this is my last slide. I'm going to leave you with this, which basically is just to remind you, we really don't have too many things we can do. We can either fight it or we can get out of the way. And in our country, we've been popping up these cities in New Orleans and on the Mississippi Delta on stilts so that when the next time this system floods, they'll be okay at least better than the person beside them. And in other countries, this is what they do. They climb a roof and wait for help. So I think this is a very serious problem, and it impacts us because we are all so very interconnected. The reason people are pumping water for the shrimp farms is to feed us, right? It isn't just to feed them. They become the protein bowls of the world. So um, how we buy what we purchase is important and has an impact in another country. And let me tell you about shrimp versus rice. If I was growing rice, I couldn't send my kids to school. If I'm growing shrimp, I can send my kids to school in, in, in Vietnam. So I'd like to send my kids to school. So therefore, pumping water out of the ground is very, I'm incentivized to do that. So solutions to this are not so that we can just say, let's do this, let's do that. It's not like that at all. It has to do with governance, how we think, how our world is interconnected. So let's work together, and you guys can play a role in all this by helping to monitor these deltas throughout the world. Thank you. Do we have any questions? 
Yeah, James, on one of your last slides there, or maybe it was your last slide, you said there was a half a billion plus people that were actually on the deltas. Let's suppose maybe when you look at uh, the agriculture and the biomass that comes out of them, that's maybe supporting a billion people out of the seven billion people that are on the planet. Yeah, we took a, like and we took a, a more recently, we took a 25 meter margin around the deltas, and that added another 130 million, so definitely plus. And, and then you have the migration that's still occurring and the population increase. So soon, soon a billion, and of course, they're being affected by the billions that are upstream of them. And then I was thinking of like just the shrimp that we eat that probably comes out of a lot of these farms. So, right. you know, we're impacted. So we're talking like a billion, maybe a billion and a half people out of the 7 billion people are on the planet or depending on these. I want you to put on your, uh, your uh, genie hat and project forward 100 years. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. I think that I think that we we are knowledge is becoming more universal. In that, when we discover a problem today, we being let's say somebody in this room discovers a problem today, it will have an impact, and its knowledge will be transferred to around the world to those who need to know very quickly. And that was not the case 30 years ago. So I think that the way information is conveyed now is very quick. So I think that's good because as we, as I travel the world and I meet some of these science ministers and secretaries and things like that in my job as IGBP, I am getting, they are not, except for one or two rare occasions, they all seem to be kind of pretty smart people who are knowledgeable about what's going on in their country. So they're making decisions on cost-benefit analysis. That's where they're coming from. Um, we could influence them, of course, but I don't think we know ourselves what they should do. We don't know what they should do. I don't know what they should do. So I think some of them are going to go in the classic way, which is what China's doing. Let's just uh, tear up more of the landscape and build a, a wall around a country. I mean, let's just do that. Let's just have no more wetlands and have no more bird migration, which will affect the coastal fisheries, and I could go on about pollution and all of this stupid idea about putting in a seawall that's... Anyway, some countries will do that. And, and China's a rich country, but you know, when China did that on the Yellow River, so in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century on the Yellow River, they had 12 to 15% of their GDP going into putting levees on the Yellow River so that it wouldn't flood. It was, at that time, it wasn't flowing into the Bohai Sea, it was flowing into the Yellow Sea. And they, built, they kept building these levees and rebuilding them, and here's, they put so much money in, and every year it would flood, or every other year, or every third year, and the floods got larger and larger because the levees trapped the sediment the, the river became super elevated so that when you had a flood, it was an even larger flood than it used to be, and yet it was soaking up an amount of, in, uh, amount of their income, the economy, that it almost made the country go broke. So my worry is that if you just go strictly with an engineering solution of putting a coastal barrier in, it sounds like we could, might be able to afford it in many countries if there is enough of a an important city, a big city, uh, an important farmland or whatever. But I think eventually that country will go broke trying to keep it. So we're now, I'm suggesting that that will be not viable for any great length of time. So maybe it would work for 50 years. And if you're going to use the sort of Native American way of thinking seven generations ahead, you know, you go in that mode, you will want to change the way you, things are done. So first off, 
getting information that you just can't be pumping water out of the ground and sinking it, or you can't be just oxidizing these peats so they burn up. That will stop it, but you can't then pump the land up, even though there's a few people who think you can. The amount of energy that would consume to pump down and get that pore pressure up and maintain it would be astronomical, but that's another story that... Anyways, I, I do think that we're going to have to lose land. We're going to have to get new farmland, and we're going to see the second largest migration, which is going to be out of the mega cities and into other cities, because those cities will become untenable. So that's my projection. This is this is being taped, so you know I have to watch myself. Be careful what I say. So, it, 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 is it, should that be done through some managed process? Because clearly the path that we're on is unsustainable. Or should it just be driven by the market as the cities become un? No, it should be managed. Um, but, you know, managing is not what you think it is. Because, no, it's just that we're dealing with communist countries, dictatorial countries, we're dealing with democratic countries, you're dealing with countries where the states are more powerful than the, the land, the main state. Uh, you know, the, the governance on the, each one of these is so unique and so different that uh, that's why I'm, I'm advising the Dutch, you know, you can't just take your your methods. And, and this, they have a Delta commissioner, a, someone who can make decisions on behalf of their entire Delta, the only pers- uh, country in the world that has such a person. So their governance is not going to be duplicated by anyone, especially our country, but any other country, I don't think. I think that, uh, you know, if you got more sediment on the land, if you were to say, well, let's say this sector of the land was, uh, um, we're going to abandon it for a few years and we're just going to flood it with dirty sediment. We're going to release some of the sediment from these dams. I mean, you might even get back into the engineering got us into this mess and maybe engineering should get us out of this mess. Maybe that's a solution. But if you don't do something, then what's going to happen is that just going to be like that. Remember that tsunami that hit um, the ten, ten day, the the Fukushima reactor, Sendai, yeah. So it had a coastal barrier. The water got on the other side and wouldn't leave. So that was part of the problem. In the New Orleans, the water breached the levees, got on the inside and wouldn't leave. You know, the pumps didn't work. So the part of the problem with coastal barriers is just like in Bangkok. You know, when you have them really high and then you get water on the other side, that's what causes the destruction. The mold spreads just like wildfire. I mean, it's it's a real problem. You mentioned uh, releasing sediment from dams, but once you've got the sediment behind a dam, how do you release it? Well, you're not going to like this answer. No, I know you're not going to like this answer because we have we have an engineering solution to this today that for many dams that are being built are not being used. So for instance, a lot of this, I don't know if you know what a turbidity current is, but think of it as a dirty snow avalanche that goes under water. So it could be in a reservoir, you have a dam, you have this reservoir, so during the flood season, when a lot of dirty water is coming in, you get this, what they call a turbidity current, and it runs along the bottom of, of the system. In Del Terrace, this uh, institute that I was dealing with, I was talking with one of their top engineers who said, we can capture that water and, and shoot it out so that dirty water is not trapped in the reservoir. We can do that today so that the dams are not trapping as much sediment as they used to. That's one example. They have other mechanisms, a flushing mechanism where they can really, but companies just don't want to spend the money. So we have to somehow, this is where governance comes in, we have to somehow get 
the people who fund it, the World Banks, who often fund dams, they're the biggest funder around the world is World Bank. So we have to get them to be more aggressive in getting the countries to spend the money that they need to spend so that at, at the very least the new dams are being built in a way that don't have this problem. But there are also other methods. The, the, the rivers go up and down all the time, so there's a little mini delta that's in at the head of every reservoir. That material could also be used to build up the landscape. I mean, we just have to take it seriously, I think.